thank you for joining us today at the Church of Quell Creek on your TV. We're always glad when you choose to worship with us. We hope through the word and through song that you will be equipped to live your life after Jesus Christ. Let's go now to our worship service and I'll be right back to talk to you shortly. on this journey with Abraham for a while. Um, again, when, when I felt like the Lord was leading me to preach through the life of Abraham, I, I struggled. One is because I knew how long we would have to spend with him. And I wanted you guys to stay with me as we went through this journey. It's difficult because the life of Abraham is full, and even as far as we've gotten, which will be today in Genesis 21, We've had to kind of move quickly to get here. Um, we could spend a year in Abraham's life. And even then, I think we would miss something. So we've, we've jetted through, but now we're in week nine of Abraham. Um, as we've been together throughout this series, um, I've got to quarantine a couple of times during this series. That was fun. Um, but as we prepare our hearts, I want to make note of a couple of things. The first is this. Um, Trinity Baptist here in town, their pastor Nate, um, is 11 weeks in, or 11 weeks, 11 days in on his battle with COVID and is still running a fever. Um, and this morning, I uh, sent out a text just encourage, encouraging us pastors around the city to preach faithfully. Um, I wanted to stop and take a minute to pray for Nate this morning, and for his church uh, there across town, they're a sister church of ours, a great church, and we want to make sure that we just take him to the throne room of the Lord. So would you just pause with me this morning, let's pray for Nate. Uh, Lord, you know Nate, you know his life, you know what's happening in his body. Lord, and I know for a fact that this morning he is yearning to be with his congregation to preach, and uh, Lord, right now he feels terrible. Uh, Lord, this fever is still there, and Lord, he is, he's not alone. There's people in our congregation and other pastors here in town that are also battling COVID. Um, Lord, we pray your hand would be upon them. Lord, this, um, Lord COVID is, is a, a terrible thing. Lord, for some, it's like me, Lord, it, it wasn't that bad, but Lord, for some, it's devastating. For some, it's taken their lives. So, Lord, let us push away the politics of, of this, and, Lord, let us focus on the people affected. Lord, would you watch over them? Lord, would you give them care? Would you bring them healing? Lord, would you be with our medical personnel who are burning the candle at both ends right now? Lord, they're overwhelmed, they're tired, and many of them are battling this sickness as well. Lord, would you just give them peace? Would you give them energy? Lord, you protect their health. Lord, we know that you are, are good in all situations. Lord, for those of us in Christ, we believe that even if COVID took our life, we would gain because we would be with you. But Lord, help us be focused today on the fact that there are many without you today. And Lord, if they died from it, they would spend eternity away from you. And may we never be okay with that. Lord, this morning, would you be with my friend Nate, heal his body. In your name we pray, amen. As we get to this passage, we're finally at the promise. 
It's taken a long time to get there, but we've arrived. And with a promise, we, we can kind of go, yay, we did it. But there's so many lingering things that have occurred leading up to this point. When we take matters into our own hands, there's always a consequence. It's the most devastating thing about a walk with the Lord, isn't it? That there's times in our lives when we've done things our own way only to find out that the ways that we pursued, the, th- the answers we tried to come up with ultimately hang on to us. And they don't leave us alone. They, they're like an albatross amongst us. They, they weigh us down. We, we don't know what to do with them. And in this passage, so much joy and so much pain are going to occur in a short amount of time. And so let's go there. Genesis chapter 21, starting with the first verse, and it starts so cheery, doesn't it? The Lord came to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he promised. And Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. At the appointed time, God had told him. Remember, as we read a while back, that God said a year from now, I will come back and you will have a son. And God kept his promise. Verse 3. Abraham named his son who was born to him, the one who Sarah bore him, Isaac. And when his son Isaac was eight years old, Abraham, eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has made me laugh and everyone who hears will laugh with me. She also said, who would have told Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have bore him a son in his old age and the child grew and was weaned. And when Abraham held a great feast on the day of Isaac was weaned, but Sarah saw the son mocking the one Hagar, the Egyptian, had born to Abraham. So she said to Abraham, drive out this slave and her son, for the son son of this slave will be a co-heir. Pardon me, let me start over. So she said to Abraham, drive out this slave with her son, for the son of this slave will not be a co-heir with my son Isaac. And this was very distressing to Abraham because of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not be distressed about the boy, about your slave. Wherever Sarah says to you, listen to her, because your offspring will be traced through Isaac. And I will also make a great nation of your slave son, because he is your offspring. Early in the morning, Abraham got up, took bread and a water skin, and put them on Hagar's shoulders, and sent her and the boy away. She left and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she left the boy under one of the bushes and went and sat at a distance. I think this is a crazy moment in passage of Scripture. About a bow shot away, for she said, I can't bear to watch the boy die. While she sat at the distance, she wept loudly, and the Lord heard the boy crying, and the angel of the Lord called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What's wrong, Hagar? Don't be afraid, for God has heard the boy crying from the place where he is. Get up and help the boy up. And grasp his hand, for I will make him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well. So she went and filled the water skin and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy, and he grew, and he settled in the wilderness and became an archer. And he settled in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him out of the land of Egypt. Before we move off that last sentence, isn't it interesting that Egypt would enter into the story of Abraham one more time? I'm always amazed that God is the greatest storyteller ever. We we tend to find our best in broken humans, don't we? Who want to write a story, and they may captivate us for a season, but only God could know how to weave our life story together. And only God could know the outcome of this story. As we look at these appointments of God, it makes me think about the times in my life where I believe that God made an appointed time with me. And how I'd wait on that moment only to be discouraged, only to be isolated and alone. I want to admit something to y'all. The other day, I was having one of those days. I, I'd gone to pick up a, a shipment that came in and the office was closed and I was angry. And I was driving around in my car and it was in that moment with the Lord, that I just told him these words. I feel alone. You ever felt that way? It's a lie, right? 
It's a lie from the devil, but man, I lived in that lie for a moment. I sat at a stoplight next to other people and looked at their faces and, and just told the Lord, Lord, why is it that I go through seasons where I feel isolated? Um, I got a call on my phone from my wife, random call. She said, hey, you have lunch plans today. She's a school teacher. That doesn't normally happen on our schedules. I said, I do. I have some time. She said, well, let's eat something together. Let's find a place together. And I got off the phone with her, and the Lord said, she is not the confidant you're looking for. I walked through a store, and as I was walking through, I, I grabbed some things we needed for our family, and I just kind of wandered for a little bit. You know how, I don't know if you ever do that in a store where you start people watching instead of shopping. And that's what I did. I would stand down aisles. I probably looked like the biggest creeper ever, you know, just standing down aisles doing this. Um, but you all look like creepers to me right now. Anyway, so uh, we're even. Um, and the Lord just spoke into my heart. What are you really looking for? I think it's the question that God was going to ask of Abraham ultimately. What was Abraham really looking for? I'm reminded of something all the time in my life, and I hope that you capture it today. If you're hoping that the promises that God's given you will fulfill your heart, you're going to seek the gift above the giver, and you're going to miss it anyway. Abraham's 100 years old. He has watched Ishmael grow, and he's watched his wife, Sarah, suffer. I mean, a woman that wouldn't bear children in Abraham's day was almost worthless to him and to the people around him. And certainly Sarah felt worthless. As a husband, the times that my wife is hurting are the worst times in my life. Times my children hurt. I hurt deeply. I never really understood it until my kids were playing sports how stressful sports really are. Until they're out on a field with a helmet on, flying at other people. It worries you, doesn't it? And as God's watching Abraham, and he's watching him hurt, what do you think God felt? You see, God knows the story of Abraham. He knows the outcomes. But he loves Abraham. Abraham is his friend. And so in this moment, as time has gone on, we saw that Abraham has lost heart. We've seen him question. We've seen him doubt. We've seen Sarah doubt. And isn't it funny that as God approaches Abraham there at the tents of memory at the time that we read that back as the very nature of the son of God is there and he says your wife will bear a son what does Sarah do she laughs but that laugh is not the same laughter that's happening in chapter 21 you see too often in our Christian walk with God we're going to miss the moments that we should be taking up Laughing them off as though it could not even remotely happen. But God has a different plan for your story and mine. So in 21, God shows up again. And he meets with Sarah. He blesses Sarah. And Sarah becomes pregnant. And has a son. And she could have named him anything. You took forever? I mean, there's names in the Bible, if you really look, they name their kids crazy things. Like the glory of God has departed. How would you like that name? But in this name, she has a different name, and you kind of wonder what it must have been like in those first few minutes. As Isaac is born, and everyone stands back and they marvel at the fact that a child has been born to Sarah and Abraham. They laughed. And when they searched for a name, they simply said, when anybody sees our son, 
He's not a joke. You see, that happened at those tents that day when Sarah laughed. But Isaac was no joking matter. He was joyful. He makes me laugh. He brings me joy. His name will be Isaac. You see, guys, God always keeps his appointments. Always. He never misses. Nothing gets in the way of that. You know what's funny? You're not even getting in the way of that. It's the most amazing thing that I've learned about God is this. If God is going to do something, he's going to do it regardless of you. Aren't y'all thankful? Oh, man, how rocky the road I have made for the Lord to walk down in my life. Just times that I have been in charge when really he's always been in charge. How often I should have laid down palms before him and instead made potholes. Because I just choose to do me. I mean, we applaud that in our culture. A self-made man, a, a person that takes it into their own hands. Only to find out at the end of our lives, there is no blessings that we receive in our life that don't come down from the Father of lights. He's that good. And the promises of God, when allowed to be fulfilled, they always produce joy. It may not at the moment. And I, I want to clarify this statement with you. Because maybe you've had this moment like I have. That when God comes through, sometimes it's devastating, isn't it? Sometimes when God shows up, we're reminded of how little we really are and how great he really is. And so when he shows up and his blessings pour out in our lives, it's not always like, he did it. Sometimes it's, oh, you did it. I'm sorry. Sorry I doubted. Sorry I didn't trust you. Sorry I didn't hold on. Lord, I'm sorry. And you may not have had that moment in your life, but I have to believe that there's people in this room that have gone through those moments like I have. Where you say to the Lord, thank you for coming through. And man, I'm sorry. Uh, I know I shouldn't be where I'm at right now, Lord. I, I'm sorry. But thank you for coming through. Because God is always available He's always available to produce a plan for us, even out of our mess. Always. You see, God is not worried about the road you lay before him because he doesn't travel down your path. You travel down his. And he watches you. And he's carefully watching over your heart. I'm very blessed that my parents live in town there's often times that as they travel to Amarillo, um, we have the Find Your Phone app, and we share our location with each other as a family. And April would lean over and she'd say something like, hey, where are your parents at? And I didn't have to call, I would, but I didn't have to because I could just pull up my phone and do Find Your Phone, and I could go, oh, they're here. They have gone literally this far. They have this far to go. wonder what they're doing. And I'd call and say, hey, what are y'all doing? And occasionally, where their phone said they were, they weren't. You see, with our best technology, sometimes even with great technology, we still don't get where we really are. You ever put in your GPS to go somewhere? And it tells you to turn off. And you know in the back of your mind that doesn't sound right, but you're like, maybe they know better than I do. Remember one time April and I were traveling from uh, Missouri back home. And we decided, hey, let's, let's stop and get some food. So we put in a, a place on our map and we clicked send and it said turn here. And so we did. And then it said turn here. And all of a sudden we were in the midst of homes off the highway completely. Having to do like weird turns, we had to go on a side road that was kind of dirt mixed with gravel. I mean, it was just weird. And all of a sudden you go, wait a second. You look up and it says, the fastest route, you're on it. And you're like, yeah, but this is messed up. 
Because even with our best technology, when we try and follow it, we get messed up. You ever done that moment where you followed it for so long you finally figured out, had you just stayed on the highway, you'd have been there by then? That's fun, huh? That's where we talk to our GPS. Where are you taking me? Which, by the way, it listens. So just watch what you say. Don't believe me. I want to say a few words and just see if this doesn't end up on your search engine today. Has anybody been looking for a food processor? Food processor, food processor, food processor. A little bit later today when you go into social media, food processor. They listen. But occasionally when we try our best, even with our best technologies, even with our best efforts, we find ourselves on roads we were not meaning to take. And that's Abraham. You see, all was good for a while. Everybody was celebrating. His son is weaned. They're having a feast. And everything is good. Abraham's 100. But he's finally got the son of promise from God. And you have to know it went a little bit like this. Hey, thanks for coming. Man, thank you. Yeah. What? Sarah wants to see me? Okay. Yeah, Sarah, what's going on? Get rid of the Egyptian woman. Excuse me? The slave we have and her son? Get rid of them. Abraham finally does the right thing, by the way. This is one of those moments in Scripture that Abraham makes the absolute right move. What happens next is beautiful. Abraham listens to God. Verse 11 says this. This is very distressing to Abraham because of his son. When he sees Ishmael, he does not see the son of a slave woman. He sees his son. He probably looked like Abraham. He had been around Abraham a lot by this point. He's, he probably taught him a lot of things. So when he sees his son, he sees his son. So Abraham hears these words and he's, he doesn't know what to do. And he listens and God says this, don't be stressed. Just don't do it. Don't, don't find yourself there. I want you to hear these words because maybe somebody in this room needs them like I need them. Don't be distressed listen to God listen to him it says about the boy and about your slave whatever Sarah says to you listen to her because your offspring will be traced through Isaac and I will also make a great nation of the slave son because he is your offspring Abraham listens to God it says the very next Part in this passage says, early the next morning, he's brought in the slave woman, he's brought in his other son, and he goes, it's time to go. Go. And he gives them provision, he sends them out. And this moment's gut-wrenching for us, isn't it? Anybody that has a child would, would know this heartbreak moment. But it goes like this, after... Some time has gone on. Hagar finally goes, we're out of water, we're out of food. My son's going to die. So she lays her son to the side. And she goes a, a bow's shot away. Scholars believe this is because she didn't want animals to eat her son. But she knew he was going to die. And so she weeps. And so does Ishmael. He doesn't know what to do about this moment. He's small. And as he weeps, as Hagar weeps, God listens. God listens. And he speaks to Hagar and he says this. What are you doing? Get up. I've got you. Your boy will not die. I'm going to make him into a nation. And all along, there's a well. When you and I have our focus on anything outside of God, it'll take our eyes off the provision that God has already given you. 
All Hagar could see was her son dying. She couldn't see a well right in front of her. Hank Huff is the, the guy that's trained his dogs. Y'all remember Hank Huff? He's come to our church a few times. He'll do something like this. He'll look at his dog and he'll say, up there, and he'll point all the way to the back pew. And that dog would take off and go all the way up and all the way to the back pew and grab a toy waiting for that dog. And say, here, the dog would take back off and come and drop that toy and sit and look at him. He said, you know, my best dog ever was a female dog. Best ever. The brightest, the most intelligent, the most obedient, the most loving. My best ever. Until she had a litter. And then all she could do is listen to her dogs. She no longer listened to me. Life is going to do that to us, folks. Life is going to take our attention and our focus onto anything else other than God. And we can allow it to happen in our life. Or we could just keep our attention on him. Hagar was around God's man for years. And as we get it, this is one of the first times she's ever really listened to God. Isn't it funny that when God speaks, Hagar hears him? I was, saw a meme the other day, and I want to repeat this. I, I think it should be said every chance we get. The rocks in the front seat, a little girl's in the back. And the rocks character says, and this is just in a meme, this isn't like in a movie. I just wish I could hear from God. The girl in the back seat says, read your Bible. The rock in the front seat goes, no, no, no. I mean, out loud, I wish I could hear from God. And she goes, okay, read your Bible out loud. Too many of us are praying to hear from God, but not hearing him speak to us because we refuse to open our Bibles. The well is right there and our attention is lost God was never going to let Hagar and Ishmael die he promised Abraham that I'm going to make a nation out of your other son only Hagar had turned her attention onto a temporary situation instead of an eternal solution and because of that her eyes were focused on the wrong thing a well that was always there. You ever had that moment? I have. Let's, let's be honest with each other. We've, we've had that moment where God's provision was already there and we've been searching and trying our best. Oh, God, if you would just show up, Lord, if you would just do this. Hey, I can do it my way. Lord, I think I found a solution. Lord, I think I have the answer. And then we go, oh, you already had the answer, didn't you, Lord? Thank you. The well's right there. The promise of Abraham would be extended to Ishmael because of Abraham. I want you to know that God has made large promises to the world. So big that a pastor can't fill them, a church can't fill them, a denomination can't fill them. Hear this. All the gathered believers can't fulfill them. Only God can. For anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. We can't do that. I wish I could do that for you. I, was, I follow a few people on Twitter. Uh, Mark Dever is one of those. He is at First Baptist Washington. And he was reading Jonathan Edwards, and a quote hit him the other day. And so he posted on Twitter, and I want to share it with you. This world is all the hell that a true Christian is to endure. This world is all the hell a true Christian is to endure. It is also all the heaven that unbelievers shall ever enjoy. For us, 
this side of heaven, we're experiencing as much hell as we will ever experience in our eternity. But for our neighbors, our co-workers, our classmates without Christ, this is as much heaven as they're going to get. This is one sorry heaven. Don't you agree? Listen, I know I'm getting older. The reason I know it is I'm getting more and more cynical about everything. I'm cynical about our government. I'm cynical about our, our current status as a nation. I, every chance we get, there's something I, I'm seeing and going, I wish we could go back. Our backwards reverse is not as good as heaven is on our front. We spend way too much time looking in the rearview mirror instead of looking at the road ahead of us. And because of that, we will invite people into our past only to find that it was just as broken as our current. When I was a kid, people still hated each other. When I was a kid, people were still corrupt. When I was a kid, people still killed each other, screamed at each other, kicked at each other, spit at each other. When I was a kid, it was exactly the same as it was for you as a kid. Our past is a lousy heaven. And our current is a lousy heaven. The election will come to an end. (laughs) We'll see how long it takes, but the voting polls will close on Tuesday. A president makes a lousy Jesus. Let me just tell you something. The hope a man can build for us will not last, regardless of who ends up being the president of the United States. But our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Please hear me. The U.S. makes a lousy heaven. Our bank accounts make a lousy heaven. Your friends make a lousy heaven. Your home makes a lousy heaven. Don't get distracted. Look for the well. During the great feast, Jesus said in a loud voice, Come to me. All of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Look for the well. One of my great heroes that I talk about often is Fred Rogers. Fred Rogers, his mother, when he was little, saw some violence play out before him, and it it scared him as a kid. His mother said to him, Fred, when bad things happen, look for the helpers. They're always there. There's always helpers. Let me just tell you, in a world full of helpers, look for the well. Because we all make lousy Jesuses. If this is as much hell as believers have to endure this side of heaven, praise God. Because it's not as bad as that. But if this is much heaven as you're going to get because you don't believe in Jesus Christ, hear me today, it's not worth it. Hell is real. Hell's a real place. And Jesus made a way so no one, not a single soul would have to go there. Today, put your belief to action and trust in him. Don't lean on your own understanding. But in all your ways, acknowledge him. If you can do that today, you can be saved. And as bad as our world is going to get, and it's going to get worse, if you're a reader of Revelation, it's not going to get better. It's as much hell as we'll have to endure. But praise God that because of Jesus, he made a way for us. Amen. Today, if you need to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to give you the same opportunity I gave you last week. I'll be down here, and I'd love to meet with you and talk to you about Jesus Christ.
Today, if you need to come and pray and kneel, you come and pray and kneel. Keep your distance. Keep your mask on. Be smart. Love your neighbor. But come. We're going to have a time of worshiping the Lord and focusing on him. And that's your chance as well. Let me pray for you. Lord, would you speak over us today? Would you remind us how much you love us? That you made a way for us in Christ. And so, Lord, teach us today to focus our lives upon you. Lord, we need you. Lord, help us to not put our hope in anything else but you, because it will always fail us. But you are the well that is always waiting for us to find. May our attentions leave the temporary, and may we find the eternal in you. God, we praise you for what you're going to do in these next few moments in our hearts. In your name we pray. Amen. We hope that today you had a moment in your living room or wherever you're watching this to take a special time to invite Jesus into your heart. I know as a pastor, my greatest joy would be that you would know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you prayed a prayer to invite him into your heart today, I would love for you to email me and let me know. I want to follow up with you and give you tools to help your faith. We always hope that you would take the time to join us here at the church at Quell Creek to worship. So go to our church website, see the times and locations and when we're meeting, and we hope to see you person to person very soon. Have a great day.